Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this chance to come together. We thank you for the privilege of worshiping you freely. We thank you for all the people who are here and all who have gone on before us to help make us this gathering possible. We ask that you send your Holy Spirit down upon us anew, that you would open our hearts and our minds, that we may hear your word, that we may have faith grown within us, that we may have the courage to believe, and that we may follow after your Son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you'll turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to be starting at verse 1 today. Also later, we're going to be looking at our Isaiah passage in chapter 50, verse 4. Uh, if you want to mark that passage as well, before you turn to Ephesians, I put that out of order. But, um, and then if you'll give me, like last week, if you'll give me an amen when you're ready, and we'll get going. <laughs> All right. I had initially titled today's sermon as No Partiality in Christ, but after doing my research and preparation today, I think a more appropriate title would be Listening to Christ. There are several reasons for that, and we'll get into them as we go. But the first is right here in front of us in Ephesians 6, 1 through 3, where Paul writes, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, and this is, the, this is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. These verses have so much meaning behind them, and even for us today. We could talk about how Paul is issuing these instructions to the children by referring to them as in the Lord, being in the Lord, or in other words, Christians. We could talk about how children should be sure to honor their father and mother and what that would look like. But what caught my eye here as I prepared for this sermon was that word obey. The word, Greek word translate, here translated as obey, hypokuo, has a direct opposite in parako, which is often translated as an unwilling to hear, unwillingness to hear. The Lutheran Study Bible here has a note on verse 1 that says the Greek word emphasizes listening to parents not just simple obedience. I know that many of you here are parents and even grandparents, and um, I would ask you, what is more important to you, or what was more important to you as you were, you were raising your children, that your child obeys in what you tell them, or that they understand why it is important what you have told them? Why is it important for them to obey you? That they simply do what you tell them, and, or that they listen and understand the wisdom that you're trying behind what you're telling them? Which is more important? Paul tells the children of the church to listen and obey to their parents in the Lord, for this is right. They are believers, baptized as infants, and so they too should seek to practice Christian ethic. The primary commandment to, of a child of the church is to honor their father and mother, but to listen, to learn, to receive wisdom, and to obey in what they are instructed to do. But Paul doesn't just give instruction to children, he commends Commands fathers in the next verse, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, I'm laying a foundation here. We're building to it. The word for discipline here is not punishment, but rather the Greek would probably be better translated as education. I, I don't know the translation decisions that they made, but it probably that that's this idea of discipline not in the form of corporal punishment, but in the form of disciplining yourself through education. Many of you here are former teachers. And would probably agree with me that listening is a part of education, is it not? How else do you know for sure if the student truly understands what is being taught, what is needed of you as a teacher if you do not listen? The questions that are asked are almost as important as the answers that are given. For we do not, if we don't understand the question being asked, we can't really answer it, can we? Some of you... and, and we, Reading these passages, you say, okay, preacher, why are we talking about this? Because I, my kids are out of the house, I have grandkids, and I'm not as much of a disciplinarian, or I've never had kids. What did we talk about last week? Every verse of the Bible is for you, right? Every verse of the Bible points to Jesus and how we interact with him. Some of you may have had difficult relationships with your children. Some of you may have had difficult relationships with your parents. I cannot help but wonder if some difficult relationships come from a failure to listen on both sides, to truly understand the questions that are being asked and to truly take the time in patience to answer those questions rather than provoking our children or parents to anger? How many times do we allow conversations to frustrate us or lead us to belittle the other party? How much of that comes from a failure to listen and to properly communicate why something is important to us, why it should be important to them? And that comes from 
teaching and preaching in, in every relationship, if we don't communicate why something's important to us and why it hurts us when they don't take it seriously or at least respect that, that causes a breakdown in the relationship, does it not? It doesn't just stop with our family relationships. Paul goes on in verse 5, Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord, not to man, knowing whatever good anyone does, he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is bond servant or free. Masters do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours in heaven, that there is no partiality with him. We can take this relationship from Paul, that Paul is describing, not just and apply it to employment, because in the context of what Paul's talking about, slavery was very real. It wasn't the same slavery that we saw here in the South back in 150, 200 years ago, but slavery was very real. And so there were, there were people who owned slaves in the church, and there were people who were slaves who had masters in the church. And that's a hard thing for us to wrap our head around culturally, but how do we, how do we apply that to us today, Right? Well, one way we can apply it is we all have people who are in authority over us. Every single one of us here. You think, well, I don't. I'm, I, don't I don't work anymore. I don't have anyone as an authority. Well, you actually, you do. You have the government, which we can be either happy or, or grown about. You have members of the church who have been appointed. You have voted to be leaders of, the, of this church and, as a council, and you submit to their leadership as they try to guide and steward this ministry Christ has given us. Some of you have earned relationships, and we are. Some men would argue that they're in authority, submitting to the authority of their wives, and vice versa. We talked about that last week a little bit, but we are all under authority somewhere. So how do we act with that? And some of us are still in authority over others. How do we relate? God has put people in authority over us in all walks of life. In some cases, placed us in authority over others in many walks of life. Whether we manage our manager, our business owner, a congressman, or a citizen, or even extending to church leadership, leadership of organizations we belong to, like Ruritan or VFW or what have you, we agree to be, take part in the mission of these organizations. We submit ourselves to those authorities, or we are put in authority by those organizations. What is our fundamental obligation? To obey to listen with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ. We do not listen and obey to make people happy. It's not why we do it. We can, but that's not why we should. Or we don't want to just appear like we're doing what we're told. We don't want to make the illusion of, uh, the illusion of obedience. That's one thing we were very good at in the army. Lower enlisted were very good about giving the illusion to their sergeants. Oh, I'm busy. What are you doing? I'm uh, sweeping the, the grass. What? Or a drill sergeant telling us to, I was once told to rake gravel in Arizona. You can appear to do it without actually doing anything. That's not what we're here for. When we show respect to those who are in government office, even if they're not worthy of respect. When we show respect to those who are in appointed positions over us, whether law enforcement in various forms, or whether we're talking about the people who are in leadership of organizations that we think, well, I could do that job better. We still show respect to them. Why? Because ultimately God has put them in that position. All governments are established and broken down by the will of God Almighty, as the prophet Daniel tells us. All employers and managers are given their authority by God, by God's grace and appointment. We submit ourselves to them because God has so led us to. He has led us to listen, to understand, to cooperate, to work together, to put ourselves last. We've talked about that the last couple of weeks, that sacrificial love of putting ourselves last and trusting God to give us what we need. Trusting in him in faith. You may say, well, pastor, what does this have to do with me? I say to you last week, these words are for you as they point to Jesus. These aren't arbitrary commands that God is giving us through Paul, but rather instructions. These are instructions on how best to enjoy the blessings that God has given us, as Paul tells us in 1 Timothy 4, 8, and 10, 8 through 10. Godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance, for it is in this we labor and strive, because we have fixed our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of all believers. 
We talked about last week about how God uses marriage and the relationship between a husband and wife to describe his relate, how he relates to his people, those who are part of his covenant in Christ's blood. Here we see again through different instructions on how we should interact as parents and children, master and servant, another glimpse into how God relates to us. If he is our heavenly father, then he has instruction for us. And he demands not just blind obedience, but true understanding and adoption of his wisdom. He wants us to listen. If he's our heavenly master, then he demands not just lip and eye service, pleasing people by looking the part of a Christian when in reality we're not, but true, he asks of us true devotion, seeking to do the will of God from the heart. Rendering service with goodwill as to the Lord. If we find ourselves in position of authority over others, we are to execute that authority with justice, patience, and love, just as the Father does. We want to be fair. We want to be honest. We want to listen to those who we've been put authority over so we know not only what they need, but what they're doing so that we can support and help them. But this is difficult. It's not easy. How do we do this well? How are we expected to listen when other person is so insufferable? Or they go on forever. They don't shut up or they keep lying. Oh my goodness. I can't turn on the news. I don't even read the news anymore. I can't do it. It's awful. I, I don't know. I can't do it. All I can do is just say, you know what? I'm going to try my hardest to do as God calls me to do and show respect to those who are respect. The lack of respect. Oh, my goodness. We could go on for an hour about that. I promise I won't. I could go on, but I won't. How can we be expected to obey, to submit, to listen when it's so hard and the other person, I can't stand them. Why are they in the same room as me? Again, the answer is not how, but who. If you flip over to the passage in Isaiah 50, we'll take a look at how Christ gives us an example of what listening looks like. In Isaiah 50, we see another prophecy of the suffering servant, a prophecy of who Christ is and how he would set an example for us all. This is a messianic passage. This is Isaiah, look, God telling Isaiah, this is who Messiah will be and what he will accomplish for us. Verse 4 tells us, The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Jesus is the perfect disciple because he listens before he speaks. To listen is the epitome of what our response is to God, what it should be to God. Rather than ignoring or rejecting what God says, the servant listens and then speaks as his father teaches. God's perfect word sustains the weary. How many times in your life have you looked been going through a difficult time and turned to the word of God and realized, oh, that's what I needed to hear. Or come to church and said, oh man, I needed to hear that. How many times God's perfect word sustained you when you were weary? We live in a world designed, it seems designed to make us tired, does it not? So many of us rely upon caffeine and other medications to keep us going only to find out we're more exhausted afterwards than we were before. Not just physically, but we are tired emotionally and mentally. The world fills us with all the terrible news it could possibly be there, all the things to be afraid of. What are we to do? What are we to say? We need to hear the reassuring word of the Lord. There is no partiality with the Lord God Almighty. It doesn't just mean that he treats us all equally as sinners covered in the blood of Christ. It means he keeps his promises equally to us as well. He keeps his promises equally to us, just as well as he sees us as clothed in the righteousness of Christ. He is master over all. He is the Lord of all creation. And so that we can rest in the knowledge that he is God and he has promised that all will be well for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. That word that sustains the weary also leads us to listen to God and obey Verses 5 and 6 says, The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I gave my back to those who strike, and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. Jesus was faithful in the face of ridicule, disgrace, shame, and abuse. He faithfully carried out the will of the Father despite the great cost to himself. Some of the great services of our church happened during Holy Week, as we remember what it is Christ went through for us, for you. It's not easy for us to listen to the word of the Lord and then go out in faithfulness, to our, in faithfulness to him. It will cost us. As Bonhoeffer said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him to come and die. 
When we set ourselves before our wife, our husband, our children, our grandchildren, our boss, our government, we set ourselves as servants to the, who have died to ourselves and put on Christ. This is what we should do. We shouldn't put ourselves ahead of everyone around us. We shouldn't say, here, well, I, I don't want to talk to that person because I would have to humble myself. I would have to disgrace myself. They may ridicule me. They may give me a hard time. I don't know if I can talk to my kids. They, we have a really contentious relationship. I don't know if I can talk to my sister. She, does, she feels uncomfortable around me. I don't know what, I can't do that. I, I require me to feel shame or disgrace or what have you. But when we confess Christ, when we refuse to render unto Caesar that which belongs to Christ, when we refuse to let anything come between us and someone else in our service to them as Christians, even if it means our pride is hurt and our dignity is lost, our impris- or even our imprisonment, our lo- a lawsuit, fake charges, what have you, when we do these things, we are honoring, we are listening, we are setting our face and saying, come what may, I'm going to follow Jesus. Even if that means having the hard conversation with a loved one. Even if that means putting ourselves outside of our comfort zone and saying, oh, I, I, I don't know if I can do that. I'm so awkward around people. What if they don't want me to visit? What if they don't want to talk to me? What if I drop in at the wrong time? I'm going to put that aside because what they need is more important than me. You may say, well, preacher, that's hard. How am I expected to do this? I can't let go of this. I can't forgive them. Or perhaps, preacher, I don't want to let go of this. I've been told my whole life to hold on to my rights with violence if necessary, to hold on to my pride. I don't want to surrender this. Or perhaps, but preacher, they're saying all kinds of false things about me. They're lying on me and destroying my reputation. How do I do that? These are valid concerns, but I tell you the answer is in the next verse. The Lord God, but the Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. In whose eyes have you been disgraced? And what rights have been taken from you that God has given you? What lies have been told on you that God has spoken truth over? I say to you that the only opinion that matters is that of God, and that you have heard his word, that he has declared over you righteousness by the blood of Christ. As verse 9 says, Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? Who can stand before the word of the Lord, which he has declared over you in baptism? You will not be put to shame, for in Christ you have been vindicated. Stand firm. Now, this is an excuse. We can't fall in. We got to be careful. We don't fall in that trap. Only God can judge me. Yeah, that should, that's a scary thing. So we repent and confess, and we make sure that we stand in the blood of Christ. Amen? But your concerns over how you can do this are also valid. It is not easy for us to drown the old Adam in the waters of baptism day after day. It is not easy for us to resist the cultural conversations on either conservative or progressive side. It is not easy for us to face the devil down as he whispers lies in your ear and reminds you of sins long forgiven. What are we to do? We fall back on the word that we have heard from other sinners' lips. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again for you. And by his blood, you have been forgiven. You stand before the Father, covered in the righteousness of Christ. This is the word of God. You are no longer dead in sin. You are alive in Christ. This is the word of God to sustain you. You die daily to self and put on Christ as you remember and live into your baptism. Will you cry out as the, fa- to, to, as the fa- Father in our gospel lesson lit, said, I believe, help my unbelief. And our God hears you. And he strengthens you through the hearing of the word preached through the, in the side of your heart and with growing faith inside your heart and equipping you for what he has given you to do. When you find yourself like, I can't do this. I can't talk to that person. I can't do this. I can't get out of my comfort zone. I can't forgive. I can't let go. I can't surrender. I can't, I can't but hold on tightly to things I don't want to lose. You say, God, help my unbelief. I am, I, I'm desperate to listen to you. Help me. And what does he do? He gives you his word. Through the mouth of another sinner who's struggling just as much as you. This is the word of God. He doesn't expect you to do it yourself. He's here for you.
You may feel as the psalmist did in Psalm 116, which is our psalm of the day today, as he says, The snares of death encompass me, and the pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffer distress and anguish. You may be crying out, O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul, as the psalmist does in verse 4. I want you to listen very carefully. I want you to listen as Paul commands children to listen. Listen as Paul instructs parents to listen as as they educate. Listen as to the Lord. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful and he has had mercy on you. He has grown faith within you by the word made flesh and the preaching of the word written. He has saved you from sin and brought you to new life in Christ Jesus and covered you in his blood and righteousness through baptism, forgiven your sins and absolution, given you forgiveness in the body and blood of Christ by communion. He will preserve you. He will comfort you. He has delivered your soul from death. And one day we will all walk before the Lord in the land of the living when Christ returns and brings about the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Heaven is a rest stop before the new creation when Christ returns and we will join him in the sky as he makes this earth. We will greet him and guide him into his kingdom, welcome him home into this brand new kingdom, a new creation, our resurrected bodies where knees don't need to be replaced, where hearing aids are no longer needed. These wonderful, wonderful things, but we still carry the scars. We still carry the scars of our wounds of what we have endured emotionally and physically. Why? Because those are the victory songs of God's grace in our life. Every scar you carry, every harsh word from a parent, every fight you had with a child, every harsh word between spouses, every awful boss you've had, every terrible government that we've endured, oh, these are moments where God's grace shines the brightest. Do not listen to the world, for all mankind are liars. As the psalmist says later in Psalm 116, verse 11. We only have to turn on the TV to see it or read social media to see it. All mankind are liars. For Adam, do not listen to the flesh. For Adam sinned greatly and longs to keep you working to prove yourself before God when you cannot do so. Do not listen to the devil, for he would have you question the word of God and remember only the evil you have done so that you would despair and fall back into sin. That catches me right there because every, I don't know how many times I've lain awake at night thinking about all the cringiest moments where I just said, oh, I can't believe I did that. Oh, that's awful. I can't, I wish I could go back and slap myself in the face. <laughs> Satan's very good about reminding us of those things that have been forgiven. Listen to the word of the Father spoken over to you in baptism as you rose from the waters covered in Christ, received the Holy Spirit, and entered the new life As you die to yourself, you are God's beloved child in whom he is well pleased. How? By Christ Jesus. So what do we do about the fractured relationship with child or parent? How do we repair the damaged relationship with sibling or friend? What do we do when our integrity is questioned by the lies of others? Or how do we deal as we suffer loss, as we listen to the word and press forward in our faith? What can we do when we are weary and overwhelmed? I'm going to deviate a little bit from my thing here. If there's a fractured relationship between parent or child and they're still living, first we have to check ourself. The first place we always must check when we are offended or when we are in conflict is, wait a minute, God, show me where I am wrong. Show me the log in my eye before I go run in my mouth. Because there's nothing more embarrassing than when you're running your mouth and someone points out, hey, you're no better. And they're right. We have to check and examine ourselves and say, God, what do I need to confess? And if we confess it to the Lord and it is forgiven, absolutely it is forgiven, but then we must go to that fractured relationship and confess and apologize and make right. And if they refuse to give you forgiveness, you walk away knowing that you're covered in Christ. Okay? I cannot stress this enough. You cannot force the forgiveness of another person. That's on them. But what you can do is in repentance and humility, Putting yourself last, say, I messed up and I am sorry. That's okay. You are covered in the blood of Christ. Amen? Amen. Okay? If there's a relationship that was fractured and that person has gone on to be with the Lord, then all you can do is trust in the words of God Almighty, your sins are forgiven you in Jesus Christ. Okay? If that person died in Christ, then they don't care anymore. 
They're with Christ. They can't hold a grudge. The flesh has been removed. They no longer are sinful. They have forgiven you. Why? Because Christ has forgiven you. And if then they're in the, pl- in the other place, well, they have other concerns. So rest in the knowledge that God has forgiven you and his forgiveness is better than anyone else's. And put it to peace. Put it to rest. When our faith falters, when we are overwhelmed, when we lose those relationships closest to us, we can do nothing but pray. We will lose relationships when we confess Christ. People will be uncomfortable when we confess Christ. They will begin to wonder, like, oh, oh, is he judging me? Like, no, we love you. Bring, come in. We want to give you hugs and love and gifts and what have you. But that may make them uncomfortable because they have things that they don't want to let go of. We have to be okay with that. Doesn't mean that we get, cut them loose. If they cut themselves loose, that's fine. But we pray for them and we pray for ourselves. We pray, we pray, we pray. Every action and every day must begin, end, and be saturated with prayer. For we are about the Lord's work in all that we do. Everything we do, from brushing our teeth to putting stuff in the blessing box to volunteering at hospice, every act we do is the Lord's work. Why? Because we are of the Lord. Amen? Amen. And so, if it is His work, then we must lean on Him through all of it. And if that mean, what that means is prayer and prayer. Martin Luther had a famous quote. He says, every morning I pray for two hours before I start my day. And if it's a busy day, then I pray for four. I cannot imagine having four hours to pray, in which to pray. I, can't, no, I have no idea when he slept. If a relationship is fractured, we must first pray and ask God to reveal our sin in the midst of it that we might repent and confess and be forgiven. We must take our sin to that individual and ask forgiveness. If the relationship is fractured not due to our words or actions, then all we can do is pray that God would restore it in his perfect timing and be okay with that if he chooses not to restore it. My friend Wyatt McIntyre, he says, prayer is the place where God breaks us down and conforms us to his will. And we have to be okay when he says no. We have to be okay when God says no because he knows better than us. Amen? Amen. The number of times he told me no outnumbers the number of times he told me yes, mostly because I have very foolish prayers. If our integrity and reputation are under attack unjustly, then we must entrust him to, his, to the Lord's hand and trust him to defend us through his means, whether that be friends or strangers. But in all we do, we must pray. I assure you that if you are walking with the Lord, if you are trusting in him wholeheartedly, if you are leaning into your baptism, I guarantee you God is defending your reputation. And if they're talking smack about you, they'll be proven wrong in time. Look at, Dan- look at the example of Daniel. If you're doing the chronological Bible reading plan with us, we have ju- just got through Daniel where all these people started talking smack about Daniel. And the only thing they could do was attack the good thing he was doing, which is praying. And God defended his, not only his reputation, but his very life. We must listen to the word of God. We must set our face to obey it no matter what that we might be unmovable in our confession of Jesus Christ. We must prayerfully trust and lean upon God in all things and then tell our souls as the psalmist does in Psalm 116, verse 7, Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. I tell all of you today, who may be weary, who may be suffering through things that I may not even know about, deep wounds of the soul that you don't want to speak for fear of breaking down. The Lord has covered it. It is healed in Jesus Christ's name. And you can return to your rest in the name of Jesus Christ. Return to your rest in your baptism, knowing all is well, even when, especially when it seems like it's not. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you so much for your word, which gives rest to the weary. We thank you so much for your gifts, which sustain us in difficult times. We thank you so much for the peace that surpasses all understanding that you give us in Christ Jesus. And when the world seems to try and take it away from us, when difficult relationships try to take that away from us, when all these things happen, help us to turn to you and cry out, I believe, help my unbelief. Help us not to turn to our own work to make it right. Help us not to turn to the various things of the world to make it right, to trust in politicians or money or work or what have you to try and make it right or to try and take control of it ourselves, but rather to help us to turn to you in prayer, 
to listen to your word carefully and to ask you according to your faithful promises that you would sustain us, to give us the faith to make it through. And Lord, we trust all things into you and to the, into your son, Jesus Christ, who died for us and is in his name we pray. Amen.